The case is tried in the state of Protonia, an imaginary country of 6 million with a Jewish community of 50,000. Protonia, with a Western-style democratic form of government, does not have a written constitution. Freedom of speech and expression were held by the Supreme Court of Protonia to be essential liberties deriving from its form of government. Administrative action limiting or denying freedom of speech was held to be invalid. Several television stations, both public and private, are being operated in Protonia, the latter by a license granted by the state. One of the most popular stations is Channel One, owned by Mr. Siegfried Heinzhammer, an ex-leader of the neo-Nazi organization which is still active in Protonia and today consists of a few thousand members. At the beginning of 1988, Channel One started to produce and transmit a weekly documentary program called A Small Window in History. The producers of the series declared that its purpose was to reconstruct and shed new light, the true light, on what really happened in the chain of important historical events that influenced the history of mankind. It soon became apparent that a common motif pervaded the chapters, concentrating on events which the Jewish factor was highlighted as the cause of worldwide catastrophic events. Members of the community started to report on the rise of anti-Semitism. Repeated complaints of the drawing of hate graffiti and swastikas on walls of Jewish institutions and posting placards calling to boycott stores and companies owned by Jews. The leaders of the Jewish community in Protonia appealed to the management of Channel One requesting that they immediately stop broadcast of the series which he defined as a clear anti-Semitic propaganda under the guise of a television broadcast. The management of the station replied that the series was faithful to the historical facts and that the producers are under obligation to report the historical truth even if it was distorted during those years by tendentious factors. Leaders of the Jewish community decided to apply to the High Court in Protonia in a petition for a declaration that the right of freedom of speech does not include the right to promote racism, anti-Semitism and to engage in racial incitement and that all liberties flow from the basic universal principles protecting the dignity of men. This High Court of the State of Protonia is uh, now in session. May it please the court. The views expressed on Channel One are without doubt false, irresponsible, reprehensible, atrocious, outrageous. It is inconceivable that anyone but an anti-Semite say these things. And in particular, to assert that the Holocaust never happened. The National Broadcasting Authority and its council totally repudiate each and every one of these views. We assert, nevertheless, that Siegfried Heinzhammer is and should be entitled to assert them and to assert them on Channel One. Now, the question whether Heinzhammer's views should be permitted to be expressed consistent with freedom of expression cannot be viewed in a vacuum. We have to look at the facts, the facts of Pretonia, the facts of the situation there, and the results which have thus far occurred and the probable results which will ensue. Now, there's a lot that can be done here short of lifting the license. There's a lot that can be done consistent with democracy. For one thing, this is not a country with a TV monopoly. Government has some TV stations, there are some private stations. If the government wants to counter this, they can put on an educational series on the Holocaust. They can and should. And the Jews of Bretonia should urge them by all means to do so. Similarly, uh, pressure should be brought on the private stations and on its advertisers to put on educational programs of this sort. Therefore, we submit that unless these things are tried and fail, we should not start limiting freedom of expression by engaging what is in, in what is clearly a prior restraint.
because what plaintiffs here seek will ultimately lead to a revocation of the TV license. That means that Heinzmer is not, being, not only being punished for what he said in the past, but is precluded from saying anything in the future and precluded from doing so even though no one in this tribunal and no one in this court knows what he wants to say. Well, which part of the declaration do you object to, Mr. Gadask? Again, not talking about the lifting of a license, but as a declaration of fundamental rights. Do you think that free speech includes the right to promote racism? Yes, Your Honor, I do. Do you think that free speech includes the right to promote anti-Semitism? Yes, Your Honor, I do. Do you think that free speech includes the right to incite violence behavior? <clears throat> well, there I have to say, incitement, if the purpose is to incite, it's still covered unless the incitement is of an immediate nature. Now, incitement is a little difficult to me measure. If somebody were to get up and say to a mass meeting, let's go out and smash some Jewish shops, and that then proceeds to happen, clearly that kind of incitement is unlawful, it's punishable, it's punishable in the United States, I'm sure it's punishable here, I'm sure it's punishable anywhere in the world. That is not what we're talking about. We are talking about somebody on television purporting talk about history. And there has been, in this case, no incitement. There has been nothing in this record to indicate that Heinzheimer or Channel One has ever called upon anyone to do anything of a violent or illegal nature. The test of truth is not the fact that it is imposed by the government but rather by its power to persuade. That is a very important concept, and you cannot persuade unless you have free discussion. <laughs> Indeed, the very act of suppression of any ideas <coughs> tends to lead people to think that there might be something in them. Why is the, go why is the government so worried about this idea? Why are they suppressing it? Is there something here that we ought to look into, I think very, very dangerous for, to have any system of justice which imposes a government-certified truth, no matter how much we believe. I would like to quote very briefly at this point from Mr. Justice Holmes, time has upset many fighting faiths. The best test of truth is the power of the thought to get itself accepted in the competition of the marketplace. Freedom of speech concerning public affairs is more than mere self-expression. It is the essence of self-government. But you say, how about racism? Is it? or should it be treated separately as an exception? Well, let me read to you briefly what Mr. Justice Barak of the Supreme Court of Israel had to say on that subject in the Kahana case a few years ago. Racism is false, but this truth can emerge only through that free petition of ideas only through that free competition of ideas and views. Through a free debate with racism on the stage of opinions and views, racism will be exposed in all its ugliness and man's equality and dignity strengthened. Now, we're not- ask you, before you leave this, you, know, you have quoted us some noble sentiments uh, going all the way back to Voltaire. They are sentiments that in the abstract, one finds very hard uh, it's very hard to voice a disagreement with. Uh, surely truth ought to triumph in the battle of ideas against falsity. But does it? And is that what the fact situation is that you're presented with? Is it not a fact that as a result of these broadcasts, uh, incidents of anti-Semitism, not 
voicings of anti-Semitism, but incidents, painting of graffiti, uh, boycotts of Jewish businessmen, and so on, began to rise. At what point do these noble sentiments have to give way to the hard, practical judgment that the rulers of a state have to make and the judges of a state have to make that this is no longer speech and harmless exercise of truth versus falsity, but in fact can promote a serious interference with the order of the state. Your Honor has zeroed in on what we regard as the key question. There is no doubt that there is a point which can be passed where the state must act to pr protect democracy. Democracy is not a license to commit suicide. And that's also to be found in American decisions. But we're not at that point. On the facts of this case, we're nowhere near it because we are dealing with a few thousand neo-Nazis and nobody has yet attempted to expose their views as false. Nobody has taken any of these countermeasures that I mentioned early on. Skokie is a suburb of Chicago. It has a heavy Jewish population, many of them Holocaust survivors. A neo-Nazi group decided that this was the appropriate place to hold the march through town. Uh, the village, and I won't go through the entire uh, procedural history, of course, but ultimately the village passed a whole bunch of ordinances which were designed in one way or another to prevent the march. And in holding the, the ordinances unconstitutional, the lower court said at page 686 to 7, defendants have no power to prevent plaintiffs from stating their political philosophy, including their opinions of blacks and Jewish people, however noxious and reprehensible that philosophy may be. The Supreme Court has held that above all else, the First Amendment means that government has no power to restrict expression because of its message, its ideas, its subject matter, or its content. We live in a society that is very conscious of racial and religious differences in which open discussion of important public issues will often require reference to racial and religious groups, often in terms which other members of those groups and others would consider insulting and degrading. And then over to page uh, 692, the distinction between inciting anger with a social condition and hatred of a person or group perceived to be responsible for that condition is impossible to draw with the requisite clarity and depends to a great extent on the frame of mind, upon the frame of mind of the listener. Basically, our position is in favor of freedom, not suppression, except in the most extraordinary of circumstances. Let's take Mr. Heinzhammer on in the court of public opinion not in the courts of law. Thank you, Your Honor. I uh, would like to uh, commence by stating that freedom of speech is not a right. It is a liberty. And there is a difference between rights and liberties. Liberty is a self-realizing right to do that which you please that which you deem proper without other people having a right to stop you. That doesn't mean that you're doing good things and that does not mean that you're doing evil things. It means that you're acting as you feel you ought to act. And that is a difference. Even if you know that you are lying, 
you are not to lie. You are at liberty to lie, and other people are at liberty to set you straight. Because doing that which you feel you ought to do, including lying, is one distorted form of self-realization. And there are ways of setting you straight beyond muzzling you. Because if you are muzzled, your will is deprived. And when your will is deprived, great harm is done to you as a person, regardless of the distorted basis of your action. Without any limitations? I am not saying without any limitations, and we will go into the question of what that means. But that is what democracy is about. Mr. Justice Agranath's decision in Kol Ha'am against the Minister of Interior, with respect, has it all. It says everything. In that decision, he went into the principle of freedom of speech and expression, its meaning to a democratic society. He drew the conclusion that Israel was a democratic society. He even found the Declaration of Independence to prove it. With respect, even without the Declaration of Independence, he would have said that. Because we are a dem they are a democratic society. And from that, he drew the conclusion that the words likely to endanger the public peace, which were used and drafted by a colonial power, which were written by a mandatory governor, could not live in Israel unless likely to endanger the public peace meant likely to endanger the peace of a democratic public. And therefore likely was likely not in any grammatical dictionarial sense, not possibly, not so probably, but sufficiently close to danger to require administrative intervention. And the term public peace is also something which we have to remember. Public peace does not mean public tranquility, serenity, brotherhood, and universal love. Public peace means that persons are enabled to act within their liberties. And public peace means that if there is no immediate tangible danger which eliminates the possibility of debate, harm which cannot be rectified by speech, that is when public speech is damaged, public liberty is damaged, that is where public peace calls for administrative protection. But when the United States, for example, a politician in Louisiana spouting the identical kind of materials that Mr. Heinzhammer has been uh, spouting, was just elected to the state legislature and uh, expects to be elected to the United States Senate. Do you wait till there are 40 senators, 49 senators, 51 senators, a president? When is that point at which the state can intervene and say, now the danger is clear? The line is fine, but we're nowhere near it. Bretonia has a legislature, and that legislature could pass perhaps some laws forbidding group libel. And those laws could be wisely enforced to prevent the great harm and pain caused to individuals by such programs as this, if the legislature deems fit. But the very fact that anti-Semites are making their anti-Semites remarks, anti-Semitic remarks, damn them. We can make counter-remarks, and we don't have to call them names. We can expose them for lightweight bigots with the hope that their children will change their minds and not follow in their father's footsteps. That is 
the great value of freedom of speech. The way to counteract those thoughts is to exist in a civilized, tolerant, open society, and ultimately, the Vatican comes out with a statement condemning anti-Semitism, condemning anti-Zionism as a form of anti-Semitism. It is not legislation which would shut up the priests, which would forbid selling New Testaments, which is called for. It is a cultural, responsible behavior by citizens exercising their liberties, sensitive of every deviation, but the sensitivity as to deviation is the sensitivity calling for the duty of reaction, not of muzzling and of prohibitions, because that doesn't work. Laor against the Film and Play Supervisory Board. Mr. Barak says in this decision that freedom of speech is also available to those who act against democracy. It is also freedom to express deviant speech. And then as to the personal hurt and insult, which will be caused to the population, to those members of, uh, to, of the Israeli population, to those Israeli citizens who experience Nazism, he says, indeed, the scene that appears in the play may injure the feelings of the Jewish audience. It certainly may injure the feelings of that part of the public that experienced the Holocaust personally. The force of democracy lies not in acknowledging my right to hear what pleases my ear. It lies in recognizing the right of the other to utter words that hurt my ears and cause pain in my heart. Freedom of speech, says Justice Holmes, is toleration of what we hate. Justice Barack is a very strong man. He not only survived the Holocaust, he survived it in dignity and, and uh, has carved out an enviable career in this country, in, in Israel. What about weaker persons? What about those for whom it's not just a searing of the memory, but a frightening, a frightening off the streets? What about the Holocaust survivors in Skokie, for instance, who, if they had merely seen American Nazi stormtroopers marching down the street would have been frightened off their own streets and out of their own security. What about the persons in Protonia who, who hearing this kind of broadcast, uh, might also be Holocaust survivors and, and see it starting all over again? What are their rights? They have a variety of ways. One way, as I said, and it's a duty, it's a civic duty, is to proclaim the truth. I would like to summarize very briefly. What we have here is a petition to the court to make a declaration which is constitu constitutionally unsound. It is a declaration which is meaningless unless coupled with a remedy the remedy which is sought is the denial of freedom of speech at a level where there is no real and imminent danger to public peace, and at a level where there is a duty to counteract those statements First, by counterstatements. Second, perhaps, by legislation, which ought to be very careful. The central issue before this court, arising from the facts and circumstances of the case at bar, is this. Whether the incitement to racial hatred, racism and anti-Semitism is protected speech in a free and democratic society like Protonia, and whether assuming that it is for the moment prima facie protected speech, whether it can nonetheless be subject to reasonable limits prescribed by law as can be demonstrably justified in a free and democratic society, if I may borrow the usage of international 
uh, jurisprudence respecting limitations, but which Mr. Justice Barak himself acknowledges in what I would refer to as his external approach to the appreciation of freedom of speech. That is to say, freedom of speech is not absolute. It is subject to external limits, and those external limits include the values underlying a social order. That is the balancing principle that Mr. Justice Barak accepts and which distinguishes him from American jurisprudence and indeed the near certainty test distinguishes itself from the clear and present danger test. I think there's a very relevant extract from the most comprehensive report ever published almost in any jurisdiction and that is the report of the Committee Respecting Hate Propaganda in Canada, otherwise known as the Cone Report after uh, Dean Maxwell Cone as he then was of McGill Law School. The committee firmly believes that Canadians who are members of any identifiable group in Canada, race, religion, and the like, are entitled to carry on their lives as Canadians without being victimized by the deliberate, vicious promotion of hatred against them. In a democratic society, freedom of speech does not mean the right to vilify. And then on the particular issue of the facts and circumstances of this case, I believe the following extract uh, is relevant as to the incidents of post-broadcast anti-Semitic graffiti and the like. And I quote, the number of organizations involved and the number of persons hurt is no test of the issue. The arithmetic of a free society like Bretonia will not be satisfied with oversimplified statistics demonstrating that few are casting stones and not many are receiving hurts. What matters is that incipient malevolence and violence all of which are inherent in hate activity, deserve national attention. And then to conclude, however small the actors may be in number, the individuals and groups promoting hate in Canada constitute, and a quote within a quote, a clear and present danger to the functioning of a democratic society, even going further than the near certainty test adopted by the Israeli Supreme Court. For in times of social stress, such hate could mushroom into a real and monstrous threat to our a way of life. Let me just deal with one argument by my colleague, and it bears on this point, Mr. Godowski. He said that the facts and circumstances of this case do not disclose, and I believe I'm quoting him, perhaps not completely, but I hope appropriately, no violence against Jews, possibly some limited property uh, damage. The view of this of petitioner is that such incitement to racial hatred in the form of graffiti property damage, that such incitement to racial hatred is inherently violent communication, that it represents, if I may borrow from the opinion of Mr. Justice ba Bach in the same Kach case and with which petitioners associate themselves, that the incitement to racial hatred is not only a near certainty, constitutes not only a near certainty of injury, but constitutes absolute certainty of injury. There is a per se harm, an inherent harm, in the injury caused as a result of such incitement to racial hatred, racism, and the like. Petitioner submits that hate mongering, of which incitement to racial hatred, in our view, is the worst kind, constitutes an assault on the very values and interests sought to be protected by freedom of expression itself. Petitioner associates itself with the purposive character of freedom of expression as set forth in the argument of respondent. We agree that freedom of expression is essential to intelligent and democratic self-government, that it is part of the search for truth in the marketplace of ideas, that expression is to be protected because it is essential to personal growth and self-realization. We have no quarrel with that. What we are saying is that incitement to racism constitutes an assault on each of these very rationales for freedom of expression itself. And when the respondent advises this court that there is nothing wrong with Holocaust denial, we can teach our children about the Holocaust, we suggest to this honorable court that the respondent is engaged in a false equivalence. Holocaust denial on the one hand is not simply combated by the truth about the Holocaust on the other. Nor does it exclude, if such legislation prohibits prohibiting Holocaust denial, it does not exclude Holocaust education in a society like Pretonia, Israel, and the like. 
These are not mutually exclusive or dichotomous remedies. It is a submission of petitioner that any free and democratic society can choose to and ought to choose to, to proscribe and prohibit such incitement to racial hatred as Holocaust denial on the one hand, and indeed engage in education about the Holocaust on the other. These are not mutually exclusive, and to offer them as equivalences is to engage in false analogies uh, as well. Suppose a, someone were to advocate, or someone were to get up and say that there was no such thing as immaculate conception. This was all a myth that was created by people who call themselves Christians. He thinks it's scientifically impossible, and he would like to, to expound on that. Is that racism? Well, the question would, there would be a number of considerations that I think would have to be uh, uh, borne in mind and would have to be determined with respect to the facts and circumstances. Number one, is that being said in a public forum? Number well, yes, two. Yes, very public, as okay. public as he can get. Number two, is it being said uh, willfully? Is it being said with a specific intent to injure? He makes a movie. He makes a movie. He says that there is no such thing as an immaculate conception. Uh, it's just a myth. Anybody can have that, uh, that mythical thought. The question is whether it seeks to single out an identifiable group on grounds of its race or religion for purposes, for purposes of in fact defaming and degrading that identifiable group. I don't know what that means. Well, it, 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 what it means is that we are dealing here with a certain mens rea, a certain malice. Does, because for example, in the Canadian law, there is a defense if in fact the accused seeks to engage in public discussion on a matter of public interest, or seeks in fact to engage in the search for truth on a matter of public interest, or seeks to express an opinion on a religious subject, all of which are distinguishable from a situation where the accused specifically intends to promote hatred against an identifiable group by reason of that group's race or religion. It is a submission of petitioner that resort should, have, should be had not only to international human rights law, with all the implications that that involves, but resort should also be had to the experience of other free and democratic uh, societies, as the Canadian Supreme Court has in invited free and democratic the judiciaries of free and democratic societies to do. It is a submission of petitioner. We have provided this court with the legislation respecting incitement to racial hatred in 19 free and democratic societies. It is the submission of petitioner that if one looks at the legislative and judicial experience of other free and democratic societies, it supports the seeking of this declaration from this honorable court. A notable exception, so Justice Mikva would certainly call me on that, would be United States. Because the United States is, in, in that regard, has not passed such legislation, nor is it a party to any of these international treaties. With all due respect, Mr. Justice Mikva, petitioner would therefore submit that the legislative and judicial experience of the United States is less relevant for purposes of this hearing than the legislative and judicial experience of other free and democratic societies who are much more like Protonia than is the United States uh, in this regard. Do you make any distinction between the right to promote racism, anti-Semitism, and uh, to engage in racial incitement? I notice that in your skeletal argument, you dwell on racial incitement while uh, your opponents dwell on promoting racism. Well, I, I think that in, in some instances, uh, these are distinctions without a difference. My opponents may have talked about a fine line, but in my view, uh, when broadcasting engages in Holocaust denial and the singling out of, of Jews as specific targets uh, of, of uh, uh, hatred by reason of their race or religion, that line, however fine it may be, has been passed with whatever definition, either incitement to racial hatred, racism, or anti-Semitism is used. L'expérience française en la matière est riche et significative, d'abord parce que la France a ratifié et introduit dans son droit les dispositions de la Convention de New York, ensuite parce que les tribunaux français ont eu fréquemment à appliquer ce droit, sans doute en raison du maintien d'un courant xénophobe et raciste non négligeable et cause ou effet de l'importance en France des théories du révisionnisme historique. Vous savez toutes et tous 
que la loi de 1972 introduisant les dispositions de la Convention de New York en droit français a modifié notre vieille loi de 1881 sur la presse en rendant effectivement les infractions de diffamation et d'injures notamment adaptées justement à ces situations d'incitation à la haine raciale. La loi de 1972 a levé ces restrictions et sont aujourd'hui punissables la provocation à la discrimination, à la haine ou la violence à l'égard d'une personne ou d'un groupe de personnes à raison de leur origine ou de leur appartenance ou de leur non-appartenance à une ethnie, une nation, une race ou une religion déterminée. Cette tendance législative française ne s'est évidemment jamais modifiée et dans un texte tout à fait récent, la loi du 2 août 1989 qui est relative aux conditions de séjour et d'entrée des étrangers en France, l'article 1er a repris ces principes en indiquant que la République française a, dès sa proclamation, affirmé ses principes d'hospitalité et de tolérance. En conséquence, elle interdit et condamne, sur tous les territoires où elle a autorité, le racisme, l'antisémitisme et la xénophobie. Alors, on pourrait penser que cet arsenal législatif est suffisant. Eh bien, il y a tout de même un mouvement d'opinion en France important qui ne le pense pas. Et vous le savez, justement, la LICRA et mon confrère et ami Bernard Joindot, que je mentionnais il y a un instant, ont proposé récemment donc de compléter ces dispositions de diverses manières, mais notamment, évidemment, en créant désormais un délit spécifique destiné à incriminer certains écrits révisionnistes comme dans certains autres pays, comme l'Allemagne ou l'Autriche. Ifring était un des premiers révisionnistes et il avait été condamné à six mois de prison avec sursis par la cour de Colmar pour provocation à la haine et à la discrimination raciale. La cour de cassation, après un certain nombre de décisions précédentes, a souligné qu'Ifring était poursuivi pour avoir publié le passage suivant. Les Juifs affirment que sous le Troisième Reich, sous Hitler, 6 millions de Juifs auraient été gazés. Je ne conteste pas cela et ne le contredirai pas, même si les Juifs affirmaient avoir eu 60 millions de victimes et je ne le mettrai même pas en doute le nombre de 600 millions. Je ne suis pas du tout en mesure d'apporter une preuve pour ou contre. La Cour de cassation a noté que les juges précédents avaient eu raison d'énoncer que ce passage pris dans son contexte tenter de mettre en doute, sinon la réalité, du moins l'importance de l'Holocauste, et de suggérer au lecteur qu'il avait été mystifié, et que par conséquent, il était tout à fait normal qu'ils aient condamné Ifrig pour, justement, provocation, dans la mesure où cette provocation à la discrimination et à la haine était caractérisée contre la communauté juive. Une autre chambre civile, cette fois-ci du tribunal de Paris, jugé alors pour la première fois, en juillet 81, le cas de M. Forisson, qui était allé beaucoup plus loin que Ifrig ou Brignot dans Minute, puisque si Ifrig et Brignot émettaient des doutes sur la réalité de l'Holocauste, alors quant à Forisson, lui, c'est très simple, chacun le sait, il en nie la réalité, il soutient évidemment qu'Auschwitz est un mensonge. Le premier cas, Forisson, est intéressant parce que l'historien ou le pseudo-historien n'a pas été recherché sur un fondement pénal, mais sur un fondement civil, celui de notre fameux article 1382 du Code civil. Forisson a manqué, a dit le tribunal, aux obligations de prudence, de circonspection objective et de neutralité intellectuelle qui s'imposent aux chercheurs et c'est la raison pour laquelle le tribunal de Paris l'a condamné civilement, je le répète. I'm going to make to take two points this afternoon. My first point would be that the uh, program the way it was proposed by the broadcaster falls outside the ambit of the expression freedom of speech. Not that there is any limitation involved. It simply falls outside the ambit of that expression. 
My second point would be that if it does fall within the term speech, in the sense of freedom of speech, then it offends a number of the limitations which any civilized country would impose, including Protonia, and therefore the declaration has uh, to be granted. I would like first to open with the first approach, namely that racism in general and anti-Semitism in particular are a priori excluded from the protection of the right to free speech. And I cannot do better than quoting from a book which I believe was mentioned by my French colleague, if I did understand his address correctly, that's a book of Jean-Paul Sartre, Anti-Semite and the Jew. At pages seven and eight, the author states, if a man attributes all or part of his own misfortunes and those of his country to the presence of Jewish elements in the community, if he proposes to remedy this state of affairs by depriving the Jews of certain of their right, by keep, keeping them out of certain economic and social activities, by expelling them from the country, by exterminating all of them, we say that he has anti-Semitic opinions. And now he focuses on the question whether this is an opinion at all. And he goes to say this, I would admit if necessary, that one may have an opinion on the government's policy in regard to the wine industry, that is, that one may decide for certain reasons either to approve or condemn the free importation of wine from Algeria. Here we have a case of holding an opinion on the administration of things, but I refuse to characterize as opinion a doctrine that is aimed directly at particular persons and that seeks to suppress their rights or to exterminate them. What is of importance to him, to Jean-Paul Sartre, is even more basic than these materialistic consideration if harm will or will not ensue. What he is doing, in effect, is using the prerogative of a citizen of a democ democracy to take a standing, to draw a line, saying freedom can go only this far. I recognize the right to a freedom of opinion. I do not recognize the right to a freedom of prejudice. Oh. Prejudice. Uh, this is also what the courts are called to do. And indeed, in High Court case 399 on 85, Kahana and the Broadcasting Board, such a statement was made by Judge Bach to the effect that racist expressions may not be tolerated in any case, and not just because of their possible harmful consequences but because they clash with the basic values of a democracy which recognizes the inherent dignity and the equal and unalienable rights of all members of the human society. I'm coming now to the question of the harmful consequences and I, I was starting by stating that I believe that words are not less dangerous than a gun. And when we try to estimate reality, we must not rely solely on the concrete, but must also recognize the reality of ideas, of myths. This lesson has been repeatedly taught by history. Words are especially dangerous because so often they are used to give an innocent appearance to a murderous intention. Words can create reality, and this reality may be twisted or falsified. Indeed, lies disguised as scientific or objective truth have been employed in many instances and for various purposes throughout history, and the consequences were disastrous. Norman Cohn book, Warrant for Genocide, described some of those instances, and it takes up in quite uh, detail the famous protocols of the elders of Zion, and see throughout history how these, how the story, the myth about the protocols of the elders of Zion ultimately brought about the most horrible consequences. Uh, just one illustration which everybody knows is the murder of the uh, German uh, Minister for Foreign Affairs, Walter Rathenau, in June 1922. And when I read the transcript of the case, it came out that those who were in, employed in the murder were sure that he was one of the elders of Zion, just in order to show how things develop from paper and words and myths to a very sad reality. The protocols of the elders of Zion are not an isolated one-time phenomenon. They were preceded by a long list of 
pseudo-scientific or pseudo-historical documents which purport to reveal the, quote, true face, unquote, of the Jew, just as that the so-called documentary series of Channel One is purporting to do. The importance of repetition is emphasized also by Serge Chakotin in his book, The Rape of Masses. According to him, and I quote, the great rule essential to success in propaganda of which Hitler thoroughly appreciated the fundamental importance without knowing anything about conditioned reflexes was that of repetition. He writes, all the ingenuity employed in the organization of propaganda, that's Hitler writing, all the ingenuity employed in the organization of propaganda would have no result if account were not rig rigorously taken at all times of a fundamental principle. It must confine itself to a few things and must constantly repeat them. Perseverance is the first and most important condition of success. To these factors, we must add the third factor, which is the failure of a government or a society to take immediate, decisive steps against the spreading of racist lies. This failure allows for the repetition of the lie, which, as we have seen, is one of the necessary ingredients for its success. A legal system, uh, Your Honor, we, does not constitute only means of control or only a link in the chain of repressive action, as it's put there. It plays an important role in establishing norms in giving us a sense of what is inside and what is outside the sphere of the legitimate, rightful human experience. We ask this honorable court, finally, to heed to the words of David Kretschmer, freedom of speech and racism, uh, which read as follows, I quote, in modern times, racism has either led to or facilitated the commission of unspeakable crimes and caused untold human suffering. Indeed, it is hard to believe that any other ideology has led to more human suffering. Historical experience teaches us that racism is not merely another of society's daily evils. Rather, it is an evil that can take on catastrophic proportions. We ask, therefore, the Honorable Court to deny this seed of evil its existence, a denial which would represent not only a moral stand but also an active participation in the combat against evil and against the danger of having history repeat itself. Thank you. It is agreed on all sides that freedom of expression is a fundamental principle to which the state of Protonia adheres in order to maintain its democratic character. But it is also agreed, and so we hold, that freedom of expression is not a legal absolute. It is subject to limitations which flow no less than the principle itself from the requirements of any viable Western-style liberal democracy. It is further common ground that any limitations on the freedom of speech and of expression have to be narrowly circumscribed so as not to encroach unduly on the realization of the governing principle. There is therefore, in the case of doubt, a strong presumption in favor of giving full effect to the liberty of men to express their thoughts and their opinions freely. The common motif of the weekly broadcasts emitted by Channel One is the story of a Jewish worldwide conspiracy to subject the whole world and its peoples to Jewish rule, thus causing catastrophic disasters to mankind. Obviously, this is nothing but a rehash of the notorious protocols of the elders of Zion, which have been exposed time and again as a fabrication concocted towards the end of the 19th century by the Okrana, the Tsarist secret political police. The court will take judicial notice of the proven fact that the so-called protocols of the elders of Zion are a forgery and that by repeating the allegations contained in them, Respondents 2 and 3 are spreading malicious falsehoods. What are the principles, the rationale underlying freedom of speech? They have been expounded in leading judicial decisions of courts in Western democracies. The ideas they enunciated also inspired the Israeli landmark decision of Mr. Justice Agronat in Kol Ha'am against the Minister of the Interior. Democracy consists in government by consent. 
The democratic process therefore requires the selection of the common aims of the people and the means of achieving them by open debate and the free exchange of views and matters of public interest. Only thus will the truth emerge through discussion and the free trade of ideas in the marketplace of ideas. Can these principles be applied by any stretch of imagination to racist hate propaganda of the kind broadcast by Channel One? Surely the answer is an emphatic no. Racist hate propaganda constitutes the very negation of political, social and personal interests of the citizen protected by freedom of expression. In the opposite language of the petitioners in the written brief in this case, it seeks not to inform but to incite, not to discuss but to degrade, not to debate but to defame. It thus disrupts the peaceful coexistence of various groups in a democratic society by engendering communal strife. But it is said that freedom of expression is also the freedom to express dangerous, annoying and deviant views which are hateful to us, Mr. Justice Barak in Kahana against the Broadcasting Authority. Yet it would be an egregious non sequitur to equate ideas which we hate with ideas that preach hatred. The respondents also sought to find support in U.S. decisions such as the Skokie case, which affirmed the right of neo-Nazis to march through a predominantly Jewish neighborhood again on the strength of the First Amendment, which forbids the making of any law abridging freedom of speech. Be that as it may, Protonia, like Great Britain and Israel, has no written constitution. The opinions expressed in the Supreme Court of Israel in the Kahane case, allowing racist speech, constitute no doubt a high-water mark in the protection of freedom of expression. That case has now to be considered subject to subsequent legislation by the Knesset outlawing publications with intent to incite racism. Racist hatred is per se by its very nature outside the sphere of values protected by freedom of expression. If nevertheless racism could somehow fall within the province of freedom of expression, then the further question would arise where the limits of that freedom are to be drawn. Precedents of the U.S. Supreme Court apply in that regard the test of clear and present danger of a breach of the peace as the result of ideas expressed, whereas Israeli decisions following the Kol Ha'am precedent prefer the test of near certainty of substantial injury to the preservation of public order. But protection will be withdrawn from speech which involves an extreme, gross and deep-going injury to the feeling of the public. Mr. Justice Barak in Lahore against the Film and Players Supervisory Board. At any event, the publication of calculated falsehood is not protected either in the U.S. or in Israel. It was argued on behalf of the respondents that the events which took place in Protonia as the result of the inflammatory broadcast by Channel One are still a far cry from what happened in Hitler's Germany and that the proper remedy against those broadcasts should be counter-propaganda to be initiated by the Jewish community. We reject these arguments. The very failure of governmental authorities in Germany during that time to take decisive steps against the danger when it was still in its incipient stage played a major role in bringing about the catastrophic consequences which ensued. A brief review of national legislation enacted in Western-type democracies in accordance with their obligation under the international treaties adopted by them discloses a wide consensus on the need to stem the tide of malicious incitement to racial hatred. These obligations are now in the process of becoming obligations of customary international law. This court finds that for the reasons stated in this judgment, the petitioners are entitled to a declaration in their favor and declares that all civil liberties flow from the universal principles protecting the dignity of men and their equality under the law and that accordingly freedom of speech and expression does not include any right to promote malicious racial incitement. And therefore, the National Broadcasting Authority, the first respondent, is required in exercising its powers to grant and revoke or to impose conditions on licenses for the operation of television stations to take into account, in the interests of society, not only the need to protect the principles of free speech and expression, but also the need to prevent the licenses granted being misused to endanger seriously the security of identifiable sections of the population of Protonia. Premier President Pierre Drey concurring that these broadcasts cannot continue without the producers having proposed for acceptance by this court 
ways and means in order to ensure a clear objective and fair view of the problem which these broadcasts purport to pose and to resolve. Judge Abner Mikva dissenting. The majority aptly states the problem to be resolved in this case to be if and to what extent freedom of expression should be subject to limitations imposed by law in order to prevent breaches of the public peace. My problem with the majority's approach to resolving this issue is the source of the law the court uses to justify restricting the challenged speech. The absence of a statutory framework for limiting speech is the gravamen of my dispute with the majority's decision. Because limitations on free speech are so dangerous, they ought to be imposed only by the elected policy makers who can and do reckon the price of the limitation against the right being protected. I am deeply disturbed by the propagation of racial and ethnic hatred that inevitably flows from broadcasts like those made by Channel One. Nonetheless, I am even more troubled by the prospects of an unelected judiciary divining appropriate limitations on the exercise of free speech.